it's here, and somebody in our church made it, but he won't let me tell you who he is. But if you ask me at the door, I'll tell you. Um, <laughs> but it looks great. And uh, if you're ever here and the cross is still on and you're like wondering, how do I shut this thing off? It stays on all the time. Okay, it's LED lights. It'll last about 14 years. We'll worry about that 14 years from now. Hopefully Jesus will come back before then. Then we don't have to deal with it. Um, so a couple other announcements. Second announcement is next week is commandment number seven. You shall not commit adultery. It will be a little bit PG-13. So if you have children that you don't want hearing that stuff, you don't want to deal with that yet, make sure you send them down to Sunday school. And uh, so that's just my warning for next week. And then also they're taking pictures constantly for this bulletin, for the online directory. So if you want your picture taken today, um, if it doesn't start raining after the uh, second, after this service, you can uh, go back out there. I know they said they, um, they, they will have walk-in appointments so they can take your picture there. Um, I'm going to pray and then we're going to get right into the message this morning. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day, Lord. We're thankful that we can sing praises to your name, Lord. And we know that uh, you are pleased when we focus our attention on who you are and what you've done. I pray now this morning as we deal with the sixth commandment and some controversial topics that come along with it, we just pray, Lord, that you would just help us, our minds and our hearts be open to what your word has to say. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So for the last two weeks we spent in commandment number five, we learned about parenting. Many of you went home and tried what you learned. So this week, in timely fashion, we're going to deal with the sixth commandment, which is you shall not murder. Exodus 20, verse 13, you shall not murder. This will help keep your kids alive because you probably tried some of these things and maybe they didn't work and you're like, what's going on here? Ah. Um, so here's the thing. This is not the reason why this commandment came next, but this commandment is here, at number six, and we're going to deal with it today. So today we're going to study, you shall not murder. For clarification purposes, I want to say this commandment is not, you shall not kill. It's actually, you shall not murder. And some people say, well, what's the difference? Authors Kevin DeYoung and Albert Moeller help us to understand that the Hebrew word for murder is ratzak, and that is only used 13 times in the Old Testament. And the Hebrew word for kill is kotel, and that is used hundreds of times in the Old Testament. So there is a difference. What is the difference? Well, murder is unauthorized or unlawful taking of a life or taking of a life with malicious intent. Kill is cause of death. So basically, if you kill somebody in a car crash, your intention wasn't to murder them. Your intention wasn't to take their life. It was an accident. So there is a difference. So murder is an offense to God. More importantly, it's an offense to God because people are made in the image of God. Let me just tell you this. Animals are not made in the image of God. People are made in the image of God. So there is going to be four controversial issues that we have to deal with when it comes to thou shall not murder. And it's based around the image of God and the fact that we are image bearers of God. After I'm done with those four controversial topics, then we're going to deal with the heart issue of murder, which is anger, and something that we all kind of have a tendency to deal with at some time in our life. So let's start with the first uh, controversial topic, and that is capital punishment. Capital punishment. Um, so basically, Genesis chapter 9, verse 6 says this, Whoever sheds the blood of a man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. Now this commandment or this, this, um, this scripture was actually set before the law. This was set before the law, and most theologians believe that the sixth commandment does not nullify what was established in Genesis chapter 9. So basically, here's how it works. God allows the governing authorities to punish by the death penalty when it comes to life for life. So the reason it's stated is this. For God made man in his own image. So basically, if somebody maliciously takes someone's life or has no authority to take someone's life, God takes an offense because the person is made in his image. So then the question becomes, does this mean the death penalty has to happen if someone murders someone? 
And I would say not necessarily. There can be movements towards rehabilitation of the offender. There can be mercy. And real, realistically, as Christians, we should never be overexcited about the death penalty actually happening. Okay, we, we obviously want to extend grace, but there are situations where the death penalty is warranted and is going to be practiced. So this is a hugely debated topic within Christianity. If you've talked about this before, um, maybe if you're in college, this is like this is a hugely debated thing because some would say, well, if it was morally wrong for somebody to take somebody's life, how does it make it morally right for that person then for their life to be taken? And we point back to Genesis chapter 9. Many people will say something like this when they're debating this, especially in Christian circles, they'll say, well, Jesus would never agree with the death penalty. Have you ever heard that before? Jesus would never agree with the death penalty. And they will cite the account of the woman caught in adultery. And some of you might remember that passage. There was a woman that she was caught in adultery, and the Pharisees and teachers of the law brought her to Jesus. And they said, listen, Jesus, the law says that this woman is caught in adultery. She should be stoned to death. And if you remember, Jesus said, okay, he who was without sin throw the first stone. Do you remember the, the rest of the, the passage? Everyone dropped their stones and walked away. So some would say, well, Jesus doesn't agree with the death penalty because here's what he said. Like, nobody's perfect and you don't have the right to do that. The problem, okay, the problem with using this passage to cite this is this passage, they were referring um, a law under the Levitical law. And if you look at the Levitical law, there's a lot of um, capital punishment type issues that don't connect with life for life. This woman committed adultery. So basically, we can't use this passage to say, okay, Jesus wouldn't agree with the life for life death penalty. So now currently in our country, I don't know if, if you know this, and I'm not going to get political or debate this or anything, but there's 30 states that have the death penalty. And the debate obviously is not going to be settled here, but there's two things that we need to remember as Christians when this topic comes up, okay? There's two things. The first is Genesis chapter 9 talks about the life for life being a reasonable punishment in cases of murder, okay? So that's what the scriptures say. The second is we as believers defer to our governing authorities, okay? We as believers defer to our governing authorities. Now, Paul, if you remember in Romans chapter 13, he talks about the governing authorities. And he actually says, um, he actually says, don't look at that yet. Um, he actually says this. He, he says, God placed all the governing authorities in, in who's ever in charge. They're in charge because God had his hand in it. Then he goes on to Romans chapter 13, verse 4, and it says this. But if you do wrong... Be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. The he is talking about the governing authority. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. So now what this passage is telling us is this, is God places governing authorities in charge to actually punish the wrongdoer and protect those who are doing good. So then the argument becomes this, because obviously... When I go through this, I have to think like you're thinking and like I'm thinking. What about these other questions? Well, what if I don't trust the government to do the right thing? Have you thought about that? What if I don't trust the government? Well, here's where it gets interesting. Because Paul was teaching the Roman church this. And by and large, the Roman government was very corrupt. So it wasn't like he was saying, okay, if there's corruption, you don't listen. He was saying, no, God placed these people in charge, and their duty as people in charge is to protect the people who do good and punish the wrongdoer. And then in many senses, God's basically saying, if they don't do that, I'll take care of them, okay? I'm going to make sure they're accountable for what they didn't do or what they did do. So that's how we as Christians view capital punishment. The second issue is just as controversial, and it's the issue of abortion. I want to be extremely sensitive because some of you have people in your family, maybe someone that you love, a friend, who has maybe had an abortion. Maybe even some of you here have had an abortion in the past. You may be bearing the burden of shame and guilt. You may be justifying it because our culture says that it's lawful. So I obviously want to be sensitive to that. 
But our culture, here's what our culture has done. They have packaged abortion by telling us that it's a woman's right to choose. Now, some of you will even say, based upon what I'm teaching, I want to take away rights from women. Let me just tell you this. That is so far from the truth, okay? I believe that men and women have rights, and I believe that it's not any of our rights to take a life. And that's truth from the scriptures. It's not our right to take a life. We're all made in God's image, and life should be respected, cared for, and protected. Now, the debate around abortion used to be this. Well, when does life really begin? Do you remember that? In the 80s and 90s, people would say, well, when does life really begin? But in all honesty, now no reputable scientist or doctor is debating this anymore. In fact, we, we're finding this, that the secular world, the medical world, is basically testing fetuses at early stages to see if there's problems with them. There's actually been fetal surgeries to actually help the fetus to thrive if there is something wrong. So obviously, the medical profession is seeing the fetus as a life. But this is not a surprise to us, okay? Because here's what the scriptures say. Let's look at Psalm 139, 13. It says, For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. That wasn't written by a doctor, okay? That was written by the psalmist who is saying, this is how God creates life, okay? You formed me together in my mother's womb. Then it goes on, Psalm 139, 16. It says, Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. You know what that's saying? God knew you before you were even born. He knew each day. He knew the purposes he has for you. He knew that you are a life that is valued and worth something, just as the fetus is a life that is valued and worth something. I believe the abortion breaks the sixth commandment, and that's why our church supports ministries like Open Door Pregnancy Center up in Tom's River. So they give women options that feel like they have no options, and they help them and assist them to be connected with those options so they do not displease the Lord and make the right decision with that baby. They also counsel women that had an abortion in the past and maybe didn't know the internal struggle that it was going to bring upon their life. I mean, this is a sensitive topic, and it's controversial, but the truth of the matter is, is there's people out there that can actually help guide and protect people from making this decision, or if they've made this decision, can help them through the, the, the guilt and the shame or whatever they're feeling. Not pressed upon by people, but by looking at what God's Word has to say. The third controversial issue is suicide. Now, many of you may have heard or been taught that if you commit suicide, it's the unforgivable sin. Has, has anybody ever been, heard that or been taught that? If you commit suicide, you are pretty much, like, unforgiven. Let me just clear things up. The only unforgivable sin is rejection of Jesus, okay? That's the only unforgivable sin. Jesus Christ loves each one of us. We are sinners, and we need a Savior. Jesus Christ is that Savior. He died on the cross to pay the price for our sins. Three days later, he rose again to prove that he is God. And the scriptures say this, all who believe will have eternal life. They will not be condemned. But you know what it says about those who do not believe? That they will be condemned. They will have to pay for their sins. Their sins will not be forgiven. So in the case of suicide, a person is breaking the sixth commandment, but that does not mean they lose their salvation, okay? Basically, the argument there is you're sinning as you're dying, so you must go to hell. But the truth of the matter is, is there's many sins that you can be committing while you're actually dying, okay? So it's not just suicide that that would be the case. See, when a person believes in Christ as their Savior, they're forgiven of their sins past present, and future. If a person doesn't believe in Christ, they're rejecting him, and that is the unforgivable sin. So the scriptures talk a little bit about suicide. There's actually five instances of suicide in the scriptures, and they are all in the context of shame and defeat. In fact, even when a noble man like Job, during his suffering, actually wants to die, 
God is actually not pleased with that request, okay? God is not pleased. He's not like, okay, I see where you're coming from, Job. Yeah, you should probably, no, he doesn't, he doesn't treat Job like that. In fact, in Job 38.3, it says this. This is what God says to Job. Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. And then in chapter 38, basically what God does is the entire chapter, Job is asking God's question, or, or God is asking Job questions. Don't you know who made this whole world? Don't you know who made you? Don't you know who orchestrated all the situations that we will go through? Where were you when I created everything, Job? Do you think you know better than me? That's what God is saying to Job. So basically what's happening here is Job is saying, I don't even want to live anymore. And God's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, you don't have the control over that. You shouldn't be asking those questions. I'm the one who asks questions. So God's not pleased with Job at this point because he was giving up and he didn't trust that God had a plan for his situation. Now, I have to say this. If anyone here has feelings of suicide, you have to reach out for help. You have to reach out for help. And let me just tell you this. Even though I might not even know you, I know these two things are true about you. Jesus loves you, and he has a plan for your life. How do I know that? He died for you. He died in your place for your sins. He loves you more than you love yourself, more than your family loves you, more than anybody loves you. He loves you. And secondly, I know he has a purpose for you, and the reason why is this. You're here, okay? You're still breathing. If you're still alive, God has a purpose for your life. So no matter what your situation is, no matter what your situation is, he has a purpose for you. So if you're having those types of feelings of depression and, and doubt and, and whether this life is worth living, you need to reach out to somebody and talk with somebody because you are precious and you're made in God's image and he loves you dearly and he has a purpose for your life. The final controversial issue is this, war. Is killing during times of war breaking the sixth commandment? Now, war is never an ideal situation, but the concept of a just war is when all efforts of peace are tried, war becomes the only option that will save more lives than lose lives. See, the problem is this. We live in a sinful world, and there are evil people that need to be stopped and can only be stopped by force. As believers, we can't stand by and allow things like genocide to happen if we have the means to stop it. We can't allow people to be enslaved and mistreated. We can't let wrongdoers continue to do wrong if we have the means to actually stop that. Unfortunately, the people who commit these atrocities don't listen to biblical instruction, and they don't listen to sound reason. And even when they're confronted about these things, they continue to go on. So in some cases, war happens. So are the people who are going out to fight those wars, are they guilty of the sixth commandment of murdering? Well, let's look at 1 Peter 2, 13 through 14. It says this, Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to the governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. Basically, in the case of going to war, you know, if, if we live in a country that unfortunately has to go to a war that's just, it's not breaking the sixth commandment if we go out and obey the leaders that God has put before us, as long as the efforts have been made. Again, very debated, okay? All four of these, I hope that you don't have to deal with any of those personally in your life. You probably will at some point. These are all super controversial issues. But the next issue, the final issue, which is not controversial, is something that we're all going to have to deal with. And that is the issue of anger. And now we come to this point of anger. And people say, well, what's the big deal about anger? Don't read that scripture yet. What's the big deal about anger? Okay. People say, how is anger connected to murder? Well, Jesus actually connects anger with murder. And here's what he says. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. 
But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. Now, here's what Jesus does. He takes this murder command, and he brings it to the heart. Because most of us would probably say this, right? You go through the Ten Commandments, you're like, thou shalt not murder? Okay, that's definitely one I'm not doing, right? But Jesus is saying, no, actually, if you harbor anger in your heart, you're actually guilty of murder. Now, the truth is our anger can lead to cruelty and violence, and this could obviously be damaging to other people. But the issue of anger runs deep in us. Now, it not only can manifest itself in us doing violent or cruel things, but it actually hurts us inside. A man named John Shiner, he's an anger management coach in Danville, California, and they actually called him as a consultant for the Pixar movie Inside Out. If you could throw up our little anger guy. Anybody see this movie? Remember that movie? It's about a kid, and, you know, they have all the emotions going on, on inside their brain, right? And there's little characters, and you kind of see how things work. Well, they actually did research and consulted with people like John Shiner, who was an anger management consultant and, and counselor, and uh, basically... What they, what they found were many things that they didn't even realize that anger actually impacts. Here's what China says. He says, there's a list of ways chronic anger can affect a person's well-being. Listen to this. He says, anger has been linked with obesity, low self-esteem, migraines, drug and alcohol addiction, depression, increased heart attack risks, lower quality relationships, higher probability of abusing others emotionally or physically or both, higher blood pressure and stroke. Chronic anger also leads to increased anxiety, insomnia, mental or brain fog and fatigue. Anybody want to be angry today? Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Okay. The benefits are endless, aren't they? Okay. For angry people. See, here's the problem. Anger just messes with everything. You know, when you're angry, it's not only that you're disobeying God and guilty of murder. He's saying, you're messing yourself up. So then we have to come to this issue is this. Well, how do I overcome anger? How do I overcome anger? And the scriptures actually teach us how to overcome anger. Now, the world will say this about overcoming anger. They're like, think pleasant thoughts, right? Or they'll say, if you're really angry, go in your room and punch a pillow instead of somebody's face, okay? Don't do that, okay? That's not what, that's not healthy, okay? Basically, what you're doing is you're just ignoring the fact that something is going on inside you that you need to overcome. So how do we overcome anger as believers? The first is we have to confess it to Jesus, you know what? If you can't admit that you are angry, you won't bring it to Jesus, okay? Maybe you're the type of person, you're like, I'm not angry. And you're like, okay, whatever. Um, tone it down a little bit. Here's the thing. If you can't admit it, you're never going to confess it. Okay, if you have people in your house that are telling you, like, you're always angry, you know, if your spouse is like, you're always angry, or if your spouse just woke you up when I started talking about anger, you have to come to some conclusion in your life and actually admit it. So admitting that you have a problem is obviously the first step. We can't live in denial. So the first step is admitting that problem, and then we need to confess it. 1 John 1, 9 through 10 says this, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Know this, if you are a believer in Christ, no matter what sin it is, if you confess it, He's faithful and just to forgive you of that and to cleanse you of it. Meaning this, he wants to help you out of it. He doesn't want you to stay in that anger. Then he goes on to say, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So basically, if you're living in denial, basically what you're saying to God is, I'm right, you're wrong. I don't have a problem. I don't know what you're talking about. You're a liar. Basically, that's what you're, you're saying this to God. When you won't admit your sin... You're actually making God out to be a liar because you actually are sinning. So don't get so caught, caught up in denial and try to prove God wrong or try to act like this isn't an issue for you. So the first thing you do is confess it. 
Second thing that we need to do is forgive like Jesus forgave. Now, maybe you're angry because someone wronged you. Maybe someone wronged you and they're not sorry. Maybe they continue to treat you badly. But the truth is, is we're called to forgive. Do you remember when Jesus was on the cross? After he was beaten, abused, flogged, spat on, called names, carried his cross, nailed to the cross, put up on the cross, people mocked him, people scorned him. You know the whole picture. Jesus was hanging on the cross, and he said a few last phrases. And when he was on the cross, he looked down at the people, right? And he said, you just wait till I'm coming back, because I'm going to put the smack down, right? It's not what he said, okay? What did he say? He looked up to his father, and he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, at this point, some of you are saying, well, the person that wronged me knows what they did. Well, that's not the point, okay? That's not the point. Jesus forgave those who put him on the cross. Jesus forgave them because, guess what? When we don't forgive, all it does is cause more anger. All it does is cause bitterness. All it does is cause hatred. So we have to look to Christ and we have to say, you know what, Jesus? Like, even, even if they meant to do that, I'm forgiving because you've told me to. And you know why he tells you to? Because he knows it's best for us. What are you really doing to that person by holding on to that anger, by not forgiving them and holding on to it? You're not doing anything. You're just making yourself a miserable person. You're making yourself a person that no one wants to be around. You're making yourself the person that really just repels other people because of your anger. And I know at some cases in, in our life, we, we justify it, right? I'm only angry because you made me angry. I'm only angry because you did that. I'm only angry because I had a stressful day at work. I'm only angry because I got a phone call that I didn't expect and it brought bad news. I'm only angry because, and that's why I lashed out like that. So we continue to justify. Which brings us to the next way that we overcome anger, and that is we need to let Jesus take control. You know what? Most of the time when we're angry, it's because we don't have control. Most of the time when we're, when we're angry, it's because we don't have control. We don't have control of a situation, maybe, or a person. Maybe somebody's just making us really angry, and they will not listen. They will not do what they need to do. They will not fall in line. Maybe you're a parent, and you're like, I'm always angry because my kids don't do what I want them to do. But the truth of the matter is, you're angry because you feel like you don't have control, and because of that, You've lost control. Now, here's what we need to do. We need to let Jesus take control. And I have good news for you. You're not in control anyway. He is in control. By you letting him take control, you're not giving him anything he doesn't have control over. You're just submitting yourself to him and saying, you know what? You have control, Lord. You're in control of this situation. There's no point in me really stewing over this, ruminating over this, thinking about it, talking about it, worrying about it, and being angry about it all the time. Well, how do I know this? Romans 8, 28 says this. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those that are called according to his purpose. So basically what that's teaching us is this. Listen, like God has control. The situation might look bleak, you may have been wronged. You know what? God is going to use this in your life. So whatever you're angry about, what are you going to learn from it? God is in control of the situation. He has a purpose for it. He's teaching you something. He's helping you learn something, whatever it might be. I mean, I can go on and on on this point because the truth of the matter is, is every situation that we come to, there's something to learn. And if we don't learn it, we're just going to keep on going through it. And guess what? If it's an anger issue, you're just going to become more and more miserable. You're going to be physically unhealthy, emotionally unhealthy, and spiritually unhealthy. So it's in your best interest to actually say, well, you know what, Jesus? What do you have for me here? What do you want me to do? What do you want me to learn? And then finally, ask Jesus to give you rest. Obviously, based upon that list of negatives, anger takes its toll on us. Emotionally, 
physically and spiritually. Do you realize you are working hard to keep angry? Do you realize that? You're working hard. You're thinking about it. You're ruminating over it. You're talking to other people about it. You're going over in your mind over and over again, keeping yourself angry, working yourself into unhealth. Do you think that's a good idea? I don't think there's anybody in this room right now that thinks that that's a good idea, but we do it. Do you know that Jesus loves you so much he wants to give you rest? Look at Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. It says this, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. You know what Jesus is saying? You got anger, bitterness, hate in your heart? Just come to me. I'll give you rest. I'll work through you. I'll work the situation out. It might not be solved the way you think it should be, but I'm going to give you rest. Just bring it to me. I love you, my child. Just bring that to me. Then Ephesians 4, 26 says this. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. You ever try to go to sleep when you're angry? Oh, it works, right? It works real good. Two o'clock in the morning, you're like, I can't believe this. And then you, you finally fall asleep, and then you wake up, start thinking about it again, right? And all of a sudden, you have a worse night's sleep. Why? Because you didn't deal with it. You didn't go to Jesus with it. You know, we always use this passage to say, like, okay, you know, work things out with other people before you go to sleep. And, yeah, we can apply it to that. You need to work things out with Jesus, okay? Because some of the things that you're angry about are not going to go away. But Jesus, who loves you, is willing to give you rest from that heavy burden. You get that? He's willing to give you rest. So when we practice these things, we'll overcome anger and not break the sixth commandment by committing murder in our heart. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day. Lord, I just pray for those who may be struggling with anger today, that you would just help them to go to you, to bring that anger to you, to let you have control, to forgive like you forgave to take all this to the cross, to be reminded that you want to deal with this with us. Lord, I pray for anybody who's struggling with some of those controversial issues that we talked about. I pray, Lord, that they would not look to a person's opinion, but they would look to what your scriptures actually teach. We're thankful for your holy word. In Jesus' name we pray. You may rise.